we are ambassadors of Christ. And the kingdom of this world is in conflict with the kingdom of heaven. And it is amazing to me during my 63 years of life how that conflict seems to have escalated. It seems so much more severe now than it, than it did just a few years ago. I remember a passage, and you'll recognize it. Uh, the Apostle Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 1. It's a quote from Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. All of Isaiah 5 is relevant today. But as I look around in the various realms of life in, in, uh, in the business world, where I do most of my work uh, as a, in, in C12, um, in education, in government, in the entertainment industry certainly, even in the church, the battle is intensifying. And it's more important now than ever that we as ambassadors understand our role and that we be fulfilling that role. The book of Mark asks and answers two questions. Uh, first of all, who is Jesus? And then secondly, what is our response to him? What is the proper response? And throughout the book, we see just evidence, 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 piling upon evidence of the person of Jesus Christ. Even the demons recognize him for who he is and are terrified at what that means for them. Even nature responds. He spoke to the winds and the waves, and they obey him. He speaks the dead to life. And his disciples, of course, they know who he is. He was asked, he asked them, who, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, you know, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter got it right. He said, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yet even Peter, moments later, imposes his view of how the things are supposed to play out on that understanding of who Jesus is. And when Jesus talked about going to the cross, Peter tries to talk him out of it, rebukes him, tells him, that's a terrible idea. Terrible idea for Jesus to go to the cross? I don't think you understand the plan, Peter. And Jesus rebukes him. You know, it's possible to understand who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? To get that question right. And yet to have a response that's not appropriate. But what we're going to look at today is really an escalation of that. Because in the passage we're going to look at today, Mark 13, Jesus talks about the time between his first coming and his second coming and some of the events around his second coming. And the question here is, what's the appropriate response for us as ambassadors as we await his return? That's, a, that's what we're going to look at today. And what we're going to see is not just what is my response to him, but really specifically, is my response end times ready? Is it end times ready? I'm not going to suggest to you today, based on a study of Mark 13, when Jesus is coming back. But I can't help but think, you know, back in 1980 or so, uh, Julie and I were attending Houston's First Baptist Church, and it was... Uh, just about that time that John Bassanio said something, I've never forgotten, he was the pastor then, and he said, you know, if Jesus doesn't come back soon, he will have missed a wonderful opportunity. And you know, I, my world's changed a lot since the early 1980s, <clears throat> and uh, if, if, if it was appropriate then for him to come back, boy, is it appropriate now. But I don't know when he's going to do that. But the changes I see in the world around me remind me that as an ambassador, my work is becoming more critically important but also it's becoming more challenging. And what Jesus is going to talk about in this chapter as he sketches out some of the things that are going to happen between his first and second coming, it's really designed to emphasize that issue of our response. And so the title for the sermon today is this, Distracted or Diligent? Because those are really the two options. We're going to look at a couple of different kinds of distraction because Jesus spells it out for us. And then we're going to look at what we mean by diligence. Because again, if we're going to be representatives of him during times like these, in whatever place in the world God has put you, whether it's the business world or education or government or entertainment or just among your neighbors, wherever you are, if we're going to be representatives of him, effective ambassadors, then we need to hear what Jesus has to say today. 
the question that kind of gave rise to Jesus' discussion here in Mark 13 is this. And we see it in Mark 13, verse 4. When will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to accomplish? How'd that come up? Well, look at Mark 13 with me, verse 1. Take a couple of steps back. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. This was Herod's temple, and it was a magnificent structure. Now, I don't know why it was that, that at that moment they felt like they needed to point that out to Jesus. Have you seen this place? Well, of course he had. But for some reason at that moment, they were just struck by its magnificence. And they mentioned it to Jesus. Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him something he was not expecting to hear, this disciple. You see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Yeah, pretty magnificent, huh? The whole thing's coming down. Not one stone will be left on another. That had happened before when they went into exile in Babylon. The temple was destroyed. Solomon's temple destroyed. They came back and they rebuilt it and it was such a, just a poor reflection of what they, the older ones remembered Solomon's temple had been. They eventually, under Herod, rebuilt a new and magnificent temple. But Jesus is saying to them right now, impressive, yeah, great, it's coming down. And not one stone will be left on another. We know what he's talking about because we have the perspective of history. It would be just a few years later in 70 AD when the legions of Titus would march through the Romans and destroy Jerusalem and the temple and wipe it all out. And we also know from the Gospels that the reason is because, well, it's, it's because of Israel's rejection of Christ. The Messiah came. He offered himself as Messiah and he was rejected by the religious leaders and by many of the people. So the offer was withdrawn. He was crucified. He rose. He ascended into heaven. And the work would go forward now through the nations, through the Gentiles. But what about Israel? Well, they have a future. But in the meantime, there were going to be consequences for their rejection of him. And those consequences included the destruction of the temple. Now, to the, to the people listening to Jesus, what? It's going to be destroyed. I mean, that, to them, that must, have, that must have seemed like, well, then, then the, the end times must be upon us. This, I mean, something that huge, something that portentous, I mean, that something that terrible. And so they ask Jesus, when will these things be? And what will be the sign? And when, when all these things are about to be accomplished? Matthew, in his account of this, records a few more comments they made. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age? You see, they connected the destruction of the temple with the coming of Christ in his millennial reign. And they assumed that, well, if this destruction is about to happen then you're about to take the throne and the end of this age will is upon us and the new age is about to begin they pushed all that together in their minds so the rest of the chapter is designed to kind of set their thinking straight because yes the temple is about to be destroyed but it doesn't mean that the messiah is about to take the throne of his father david and rule over the world at that time those are two very different events separated by quite a lot and he explains that separation in chapter 13. But more to the point, he describes here what to expect and how we are to conduct ourselves in the meantime. First of all, what to expect. Jesus answered. He says in verse 5 and then in verse 7, See that no one leads you astray. The end is not yet. Yes, I know, what I've just said is terrifying. The destruction of the temple. But don't be led astray. The end is not yet. Let's look at it in detail. Verse 5, And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. There are these are but the beginnings of birth pains, he says. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Okay, let's pause there for a moment. Before Jesus return, before he ascends to the throne of his father David and sets up the millennial kingdom, the gospel's got to be preached to all nations. That hadn't happened yet. 
So there's this period of time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming when his followers get the word out. And of course, we know this from the Great Commission at the end of Matthew. And, and so this, we, we understand all this. But there's quite a lot of time between those two events. And during that time, look what he describes. He talks about wars and rumors of wars. <clears throat> and, and he talks about nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, famines, all, all kinds of things. But then he caps it off in verse 9 and following with what it's going to mean for us to be his ambassadors as these tensions rise. And this is all before his second coming. For they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. So that business of representing him to the world as his ambassadors, of proclaiming the gospel to all nations, it's a risky business, it turns out. It's frightening. But until that happens, the, the, the events that will immediately precede his coming, those aren't going to unfold yet. So they were thinking destruction of the temple, setting up in the millennial kingdom. No, no, no. Don't be deceived. It's not going to happen that way. There's a lot of time in between. But the next thing is really for us the most important. Because while he explains this over and over again throughout the chapter, and we'll see this, he issues warnings. And the, well, I'm sorry, I didn't even get to this slide. What to expect? Verses 6 through 13, history up until Jesus returns. Events just before his return in verses 14 through 23. And by the way, interestingly, these events in verses 14 through 23 are the very events that we studied recently in our look at the book of Daniel. And so as Jesus is describing the events that precede his coming, he's describing it exactly the way Daniel did, and he identifies himself as the great king, this great prince, the one who would rule over the world that Daniel prophesied. So this, this understanding of who Jesus is has been, has been escalated. I mean, it's, he is that, that great king, that, that, that Messiah who would rule over the nations. And then he describes the events of his second coming in verses 24 through 27. We'll look at those again in a moment. But in the meantime, he has some warnings. Verse 9, you noticed when he said, be on your guard. He says that again in verse 23. But be on guard, I've told you all things beforehand. And then in verse 33, he says it again. Be on guard, keep awake. And then in verse 34, he says, stay awake. Again, in 35, stay awake. In verse 37, again, I say to you, stay awake. So throughout this discourse on the events between Jesus' first and second coming, the advice he has to us is simple. Be on guard, stay awake. And he says it over and over again. This is the application for us. This is what we're going to glean from this passage. Not some speculation about when Jesus is going to come back, though I agree that if he doesn't come back soon, he will have missed a wonderful opportunity. No, the point of the passage is how are we to conduct ourselves as his ambassadors in the meantime? What is an appropriate response to these events and to the person of Jesus? How are we to live? That's what he's going to talk about. As this passage unfolds with all this be on guard and stay awake, Jesus expresses two concerns. You might call them spiritual distraction and secular distraction. You'll notice I put the word spiritual there in so-called scare quotes. It, it's, not, it's not as spiritual as it might sound. We think of it as spiritual, but it's really not. But there's a kind of distraction that's spiritual. And then another kind that's very definitely secular. Most of the emphasis in this chapter is really on the first one, this so-called spiritual distraction. Let's dive into that a little bit more. Spiritual distraction, what does that mean? Well, we saw something interesting in verse 5. See that no one leads you astray. Now, what might lead us astray? What does he have in mind there? What, what could how could someone lead us astray? Well, verse 6, many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars and so on, don't be alarmed. But anyway, isn't that interesting? The thing that could lead us astray is, uh, well, it presents as being spiritual. It's in fact mistaken. But it's presented as being spiritual. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. Now jump ahead to verse 21. 
And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, there He is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. So again, this risk of being led astray is associated with a kind of spiritual interest, a kind of fascination. And so that's why I call it spiritual, but it's not really legitimate, but, so I put it in those quotes. And then Jesus concludes verse 23, as I said, but be on guard, I've told you all these things beforehand. What's the concern here? What is it that could lead us astray? Let me ask you this question. How does your love for, your fascination with the Bible and even prophecy drive your behavior as an ambassador of Christ? I mean, it's, it's wonderful and important to, to love the teaching of the Word of God. It's entirely appropriate that we study the prophecy. There's a special promise of blessing for those who love His appearing. I mean, all of that is, is very biblical. But the question is this. What does that drive you to do? How do you improve as a result, as an ambassador? What's the consequence of you believing those things? I mean, have you ever seen people who become so fascinated with this point of theology and this particular system of teaching or this idea that it, it honestly goes somewhat beyond the text and becomes speculative? And then speculation leads to more speculation. And you start drawing logical conclusions. And if that's true, then this must also be true. And it all becomes a, a kind of fascination with it. And, and you become consumed by that. Okay, well, that's kind of familiar. I mean, I've seen that. Maybe you have too. Uh, but have you ever noticed how easily that kind of fascination can cause us to become disengaged? from practical ambassadorship. You know, the point of biblical teaching, including and especially around prophecy, is not to cause us to be so fascinated by it and so interested in it that it becomes an end in itself. But instead, the point is to orient us to the world around us, where it's headed under the sovereignty, the providence of God, and the implications of that for our role as his representatives in the world. Okay, if these things are true, what are we as his ambassadors supposed to do? How are we to live differently? How are we to engage on his behalf, given that these things are true? It's not that fascination with prophecy is wrong. On the contrary. I mean, if God didn't want us to know it, he wouldn't have told us this stuff. The question isn't, how much of this do you know? The question is, what do you do with it? And there's a very real risk, and I think for many it's a reality, of being led astray in this sense. You're not acting on it anymore. It just becomes something intellectual. Something you think about and talk about and read about, and, and, and yet it doesn't actually fuel your engagement with this world and your role as an ambassador of Christ. Because see, that's what it's supposed to do. And so you've been led astray. You've become spiritually distracted. The, it sounds very spiritual, all this fascination. But if it becomes a distraction, it's a distraction. And it's distracted you from the task of an ambassador. So ask yourself, how is my love for biblical truth and my, my interest in prophecy which is commended in God's Word. How's it actually driving my behavior? What do I do with it? Or am I acting on that? Or am I just being fascinated? Because if you become disengaged, you're not doing the work of an ambassador. So that's one set of risks that Jesus identifies, spiritual distraction. But then there's another set of risks, secular distraction. Now we see this kind of comes up at the end in verses 34 through 36. But I want to start in verse 28. Because verses 28 and following are sort of the application section of what, of what Jesus has revealed. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out leaves, you know that summer is near. You know that. You can tell. Yep, summer's coming. 
So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he, Messiah, is near at the very gates. What things? Well, this takes us all the way back to verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the ones who are on the top of his housetop not go down or enter his house, and so on. Pray that it may not happen in winter, verse 18. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been seen from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved for the sake of of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. It will be that severe. Now these, these are the events that were described in Daniel. And Jesus repeats it here. He just validates Dan what Daniel said. Absolutely true. And by the way, he points out, Daniel was talking about me. Wow, that's huge. But when these events that are described by Daniel and restated and validated here by Jesus begin to unfold... He says in verse 29, when you see these things taking place, you know that he, the Messiah himself, is near at the gates. Truly I say to you, this generation who sees those things will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It, when you see these events, Israel, begin to unfold, the ones spoken of by Daniel, restated here by Jesus, you can absolutely guarantee that we're go all the way to the second coming of Christ. That stopwatch that resumes its countdown that we talked about from Romans 9, it will continue that countdown until the second coming of Christ. There will be no additional pauses, no additional delays. It's coming. And Jesus says to them, don't miss that. Verse 32, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. He said, I'm not telling you when it is because, interestingly enough, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son but only the Father. At this point, Jesus said, I don't even know when the Father's going to send me back. It's interesting, though, when uh, Jesus is raised from the dead, you look at it in Acts 1-7, uh, they ask him again, is it this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the time the Father set by his own authority. And most commentators think, oh, Jesus knows now. And it makes sense that he would know now because in Matthew 28, verse 18, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So I, think, I take it that at this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, the Father is not revealed to the Son the date of his return. But by the time he's resurrected, it seems that, that may have changed and that Jesus may know at that time when he's coming back. But the point is, we don't. I mean, after all, if we did know, I think it might drive that same in disengagement and unhealthy... Well, it's happened throughout history, hasn't it? People think, okay, this is it. He's coming. And they disengage. I mean, some, physically, literally, they sell off everything they own, they put on white robes, and they go to a mountaintop. Most people don't do that. But I remember a time in the mid-80s when there was a book running around, I think it was in 88, 88 reasons that, that the rapture is going to occur in 1988. Or, and, and, it, and people were getting really alarmed and concerned. And people were figuring out, well, what are we going to do? And it, it became the real focus of attention. When it didn't happen, the next year a book came out, 89 reasons, that it, the 89th reason is because it didn't happen in 88. And the theory was in that book that, well, God, God allowed us to make this obvious mistake in our calculations so that we, everyone would have one more year of warning. It gets awfully convenient at that point. But you can see what happens at times like that. People become disengaged, and that's not what he wants. I mean, when the time comes for the Lord to recall his ambassadors, he will do that. But right now, he leaves us on assignment to do the work he's called us to do. But going back to the text, be on guard, he says. Keep awake. Man, he keeps saying that. Yes, yes, be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. Now, he's the man. He's, he's, he's about to die on the cross, rise from the dead. He's ascending into heaven. He is that man going on a journey. Okay, so here's, here's the story. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. That's what he's done. He has, he has ascended into heaven, but before he did, he puts us in charge of advancing his kingdom agenda, and he's given us that work to do. 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1-8, other passages. We have an assignment. We have authority, and we have an assignment. He says, okay, it's like that guy that does this. Goes away on a journey. Before he leaves, he puts his ser- gives the servants authority to act on his behalf. He gives them an assignment. He gives them work to do. And he, puts, uh, and, and he commands the doorkeeper to stay away. Don't get careless. Don't get distracted. Stay on the alert. Before we read the rest of the passage, I want to just talk to you about the solution here. What we're seeing is watchful diligence. Watchful diligence. Therefore, verse 35, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. There's the risk. Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Okay, what's his concern here? His concern here is this secular distraction. Because what can so easily happen is, okay, we've been given authority to act on his behalf as his ambassadors, his representatives, uh, but we forget that. We say, oh, well, yeah, I forgot. yes, thank you for the reminder. I kind of forgot that. We've been given an assignment. But that sort of slips away, and we, we get confused about what it is we're supposed to be doing. I experienced this. You know, when I left pastoral ministry and got into oil and gas, uh, what I discovered was this whole all-consuming world of work to be done, major capital projects all over the world. And it was a very complete secular assignment. It involved enormous amounts of work, enormous amounts of travel. It was its own reality with its own goals and objectives and the people I was talking to and the things I was working on and the metrics of success and, you know, the engagement with clients and all the data work I had to do. I did probabilistic risk assessment on scheduling cost and project execution planning. So it was a deep dive into the details of project execution on these big, huge, crazy projects. And you just just get consumed by that. That becomes your world. And it's what you think about. It's what you talk with people about. It just occupies all the bandwidth you've got. And this thing about being an ambassador just slips away. And the assignment that God gave you to represent Him among those people in those places you find that you're doing little or no of that. Little or none. You're, you're too busy doing what everybody else is doing in that space. There's no, you look at what the life you're living there, and it's no different from the life they're living. The things that occupy them, no different from the things that occupy you. You've sort of gone native as an ambassador. You forgot, oh yeah, I'm actually not here to go native in this country, this place, these people, this culture that God sent me to. I'm here on a mission to represent Him. You forget that. I understand. But Jesus says, no, no, no. See, by the way, that's what falling asleep looks like. So He comes back, let's say He'd come back ten years ago. What would He have found? He would have found Keith living a life that's indistinguishable, in most respects, from the people God had sent him to reach. Keith talking about the same things that those people talked about, occupied with the same things that occupy all of them. How was I being an ambassador? Well, I really wasn't. I'd fallen asleep on the job. So that's, that's the warning here, and the admonition, the solution, is watchful diligence. You've been given authority. You've been given a role to represent me, he tells us, among this group of people. Be diligent in that work and remain watchful and aware and awake and on guard so that you don't get distracted from it. It does not mean, by the way, that you quit your secular job and go into some sort of missions work. Because, I mean, you know me. My whole thing is marketplace ministry. I work with Christian business leaders all the time. That's what I do now. Because you see, the marketplace is their assignment. That's where God has put them. They are His ambassadors to those people and to those places. That's their role there. And yes, as tent makers, to use the 
expression, you know, Paul made tents to support himself. Yes, you will, I made my living as an ambassador right there among the people that I was supposed to reach and serve, doing the same work they did. But my role is fundamentally different. And I need to maintain a watchful diligence. Diligence in the work that he gave me to do and watchfulness so I don't get distracted. I don't get drawn away. And so he says to us, on guard and awake, both now, during this period we're living, right now, but also, if you read verses 14 through 23, as the end times events begin to unfold, yes, then too. I'm not addressing the question, because Jesus doesn't, of the rapture of the church. I personally believe that we will be taken out before this abomination of desolation thing in verse 14. But I don't believe that because of anything that's said in Mark 13, so I won't preach it here. But don't think that because you might agree with me that the rapture of the church happens before those events described in Daniel, that, we, that none of this applies to us. Because he, he gives the same advice to be on guard, not be led astray, to remain awake to us. And that's why I think he says in verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Because I know what it's like and I know how easy it is to fall asleep on the job and to just forget that I'm an ambassador. Jesus will come back. When? I don't know. But until then, I need to act with authority. I need to stay on task. And I need to stay awake. Ask yourself, Okay, act with authority. In what ways ha might I have relinquished my authority? Because if what the Bible says is true, and it is, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ to wherever he sent you. And he himself says he's given you full authority to act on his behalf in that realm, to represent him, your sovereign. In what ways might have you relinquished your authority? Just gone with the flow. Let your voice be silenced. Blend it in so that your distinctive role as a representative of the King of Kings is no longer visible to anyone. In what ways have you relinquished the kingdom authority that God gave you? I mean, frankly, as we look around, in education, we see the consequences of relinquished authority. In business, we see the consequences of the ambassadors of Christ in that realm relinquishing their kingdom authority. In government, entertainment, in all walks of life, we see the consequences of the people of God relinquishing our kingdom authority and just going with the flow. In what ways have you done that? Secondly, stay on task. In what ways have, might you have strayed from your assignment? I told you my story. I got totally consumed by the work of a project management consultant on major capital projects in the oil and gas business. And as a result, I became indistinguishable from my colleagues. I mean, I was a nice guy and everything, and, but honestly, even those who didn't know Christ, they were pretty nice people too. And if I shine just a little bit more, I wasn't very good at telling people why. I talked to you before about stolen glory, by like laying claim to the glory of a changed life that really belongs to Christ. We've talked about that before. But in what ways might you have strayed from your assignment as an ambassador in the places he's put you, of representing him, doing the work of building the kingdom, and what did Jesus say in Acts 1.8? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's associated with the authority you've been given. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Have you let that task slip away from you? It's where you're not on mission for him anymore. And then finally, stay awake. Have you fallen asleep on the job? And if Jesus were to come back unexpectedly, would he find that it seems you've forgotten what it was he gave you to do? 
Who is Jesus? We've seen so much in this book, and the book's not even over. We'll see so much more. Okay. Being part of a church like this, I, I'm guessing you'd get that answer right. Yes, but what is your response to him? And especially in this chapter, what is your response to him as an ambassador during times of kingdom conflict? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have shared with us the good news of your ultimate victory in the world. The eventual return of Christ and his reign. The fact that in him we win. But Father, I, I pray for each one of us, beginning with myself, that we would not relinquish the authority that you've given us as your representatives in the places and among the people you've placed us. That we would not let the assignment fall by the wayside as we get busy doing, with the same, busy doing the same thing the world does. But that we'd stay awake, that we'd be on guard, that we'd be vigilant, not led astray. And that when you do recall us as your ambassadors, you would be able to say to us, well done, good and faithful servants. Christ's name we pray. Amen.